This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula. Find out how to get 26% off the best deal in streaming at the end of the video. I'm in Paris and I'm actually on the Champs Elysees. You can probably just make out the Arc de Triomphe behind me. Not the great, greatest of places to choose to film because it's very noisy here, but while the traffic stopped, I thought I'd quickly tell you where I'm going. I'm going uh, on a pilgrimage and Paris is my joint favorite city in the world. I absolutely love visiting, but I'm normally with my wife. In fact, that was where we first came on our very first holiday when we were 18. Um, oh God, this is starting to sound like a vlog, isn't it? Normally when I come with the family, uh, I don't want to subject them to my particular strange uh, tourist attractions. So because I'm here on my own, I'm making a pilgrimage to an unassuming part of the city where the history of medicine uh, changed forever, just over 200 years ago. This is the Necker Hospital in the 7th arrondissement, and back in 1816, a young doctor called René Lenec was working here in the tuberculosis wards. Unfortunately, interloping tourists aren't allowed to wander through hospitals in these plague times, so I can only show you the outside, but while it is now an enormous modern hospital occupying an entire city block, you can still see the old buildings where history was made. To explain what momentous thing happened here, I thought I'd wander across town from my hotel where I was attending a cardiology conference, and it was a glorious day when I set off, but... Heavens have opened on the Champs-Elysees, and it was a beautiful sunny day earlier, which has changed, um, and I don't carry an umbrella because uh, it's an unnatural abomination that goes against an act of God. So I'm getting lost. But our story starts here in the uh, Jardin des Tuileries next to the Louvre, um, where Lenec was wa walking early one morning. I think he was considerably less wet than me. And he saw two children playing a game with a stick, where one of them put the stick to his ear and the other one scratched the other end. And of course, the sound was transmitted. They understood the acoustics involved, transmitting a quiet sound to the ear in a different way. And they gave Lenec an idea, hence becoming history's first child stick talk influencers. And sometime later, at the back at the Necker Hospital, <laughs> Lenec was called to see uh, a young woman with general symptoms of uh, heart disease. And um, he described that she was particularly generously proportioned um, and overweight young lady. And so the traditional way of listening to her heart, he felt wasn't entirely appropriate, being a bashful gentleman with a young female patient, which was for thousands of years, doctors have just put their ear on the patient's chest to listen to the heart. So realizing this might not be appropriate nor indeed effective, he remembered the kids from here in the uh, Tuileries Gardens and uh, rolled up a wad of paper, formed a cylinder and placed it to her chest. I was hoping my actually French friend Barris would do the voice over here, but he decided to go on holiday. Very unprofessional, Phil. I was surprised and elated to be able to hear the beating of her heart with far greater clearness than I ever had with direct application of my ear. I immediately saw this might become an indispensable method for studying not only the beating of the heart, but all movements able of producing sound in the chest cavity. I made a whole video about why the heart has such an important role in the development of how we use sound in medicine, and why I, as a cardiologist, am particularly passionate about the history of this tool that has become the very symbol of my profession. But if there's one person who thinks about the history of the stethoscope more than even me, it's my friend Dr. Adam Rodman who works out in Boston, and he has a fantastic podcast about medical history called Bedside Rounds that is honestly one of my favourites. If you like the kind of historical stuff I make, you'll love his podcast. I started by asking Adam about the history of sound in how doctors make diagnoses, and how, like some of the best things in life, it began with wine. Sound as part of diagnosis is actually very, very old. In the Hippocratic Corpus, we have this idea of the succession splash. Ah, Adam, old chap, the uh, succession splash, I think, is what happened when Kendall crashed into a river. But what I'm sure you meant to say was the succussion splash, which is the oldest known method of using sound in diagnosis. It wasn't particularly elegant. You literally just shook 
the patient and listened for a splash coming from the stomach, which might suggest distension. I, I will say that sound in medicine certainly took a, a backseat until the 18th century, right? Now, if you want to talk about smell or taste in medicine, which is rather gross, uh, uroscopy and even examination of the stool was very common. Uh, but not necessarily sound, until Alan Brueger, he's working in the Spanish military hospital. Everyone is dying, this is in the 1760s, of tuberculosis and end-stage tuberculosis. So people have very large pleural effusions, uh, fluid in their lungs. And uh, this is at the, let's say, the dawn of pathologic anatomy. So his patients would die, and he would autopsy them, and there would be a ton of fluid in their lungs. And so the story goes, is that his father was an innkeeper, and he would keep wine in the basement. And, you know, a lot of people come, you got to find the barrel of wine that has enough to feed or feed to, to give libations to everybody. What his father, the innkeeper, did was to tap on the side of a barrel to listen to how much liquid is inside. And I'm going to try and demonstrate using some paint pots that's the nearest I've got to wine barrels, sadly, that I've got lying around. Now, this one is full, so let's hear what it sounds like. So that's what we call dull. And if a chest is full of fluid, then we refer to this as a kind of stony, dull sound. Whereas this one's about two thirds empty. So let's have a listen and contrast. Still kind of dull at the bottom, but as we move up, it's got a much more hollow sound. And I can demonstrate on myself if I just come close to the mic. You can hear as I tap over my lungs, it's a hollow sound, as I hope it should be, but it isn't always the case. And Alan Brueger remembered what his dad had done, and he started to do that on his patients who were dying of tuberculosis. And now the difference, well, it's actually very similar. His father would confirm where his tapping was by tapping the barrel and getting the wine out. Alan Brueger would tap out where he felt the pleural effusion was, and then when they died, he would perform an autopsy and see where, where the fluid level was. And this is an examination technique called percussion. And it's exactly what we still do to listen for fluid that's collected in the chest. It may seem obvious to you now, but this was the advent of modern pathological anatomical diagnosis. Up until then, apart from some basic external clues, we really had to rely on post-mortems, autopsies, to know what was going on inside the body. But this was really the advent of figuring out what pathological processes, what was going wrong while the patient was still alive. And this is really the first, uh, I think, the first modern example of sound being used in diagnosis. Um, so, right, he should have been a legend, but in fact he was not. Uh, he was fired, right? He was uh, disowned by his mentor, the world was not ready for his ideas. He actually did quite well for himself. Again, he was wealthy, and I, I know he was friends with Mozart, and he uh, commissioned an opera. So I don't feel too bad for him, but that was basically the end of his career in medicine. Fast forward some years to our hero René Lenec in Paris, and by now the idea of recording examination findings during life and then correlating them after death had become commonplace. And after that momentous day that we've already heard about when he first listened, he begins to hone his craft. He auscultates, he listens with his stethoscope, and when his patients died, and you can still read his book today, you can see what they died from, they're horrific diseases, he performed an autopsy, and he was very, very careful to link all of the findings that he heard with his ear uh, to what he found on autopsy. Here's some trivia for you. Did you know that the stethoscope being invented at the Necker Hospital by a man called Lenek is actually the reason we wear it around the neck. He experimented with different types of wood. He turned them on his lathe to see which type of wood would allow for the best auscultation. And um, if you want to do show and tell, this is a recreation of Linex's original cylinder. Um, I got it from, <laughs> this is 3D printed. And uh, I actually still listen with a wooden stethoscope. So this is my stethoscope. And this is a uh, cherry, which is the same wood that Lineck ended up deciding that was the best for uh, for cardiac auscultation. Nerds! Unfortunately, he died in his home at Brittany um, of tuberculosis. So one of one of the great ironies, he was actually a very humanistic physician, very concerned about his patients, and very devastated when they died, uh, and dedicated his career to them and ended up dying of the same disease that he was treating. So why are Adam and I so obsessed with the history of this one particular item from a doctor's bag? 
From my perspective, the stethoscope was really the first diagnostic test. It is the first test that a physician, it's a technology, right? So it's the first test that a physician could use to make a diagnosis beyond effectively talking to the person. Um, and yes, there was percussion before that, but you're still using your hands. So from a like 21st century perspective, this was the first use of technology in diagnosing a patient. And if you think about the test that we order today, like the fact that I can order a PET scan, that we, uh, that we put a radio tracer in a person to literally look at metabolism of cancer cells and then get a 3D recreation of that. Well, the stethoscope is the beginning of that long technological journey. And the stethoscope itself has come on a journey from the hollow wooden cylinder to the ubiquitous rubber tubes. This is the Littmann Master Cardiology because... Of course it is, what else would I use, to something like this. This is the Echo Duo. It's an electronic stethoscope which can wirelessly send the sound via Bluetooth to my phone where I can record it and use it for teaching. Some people say that the handheld ultrasound device, like the one I used in my Zero Gravity video, is the natural evolution of the stethoscope. It's many times more expensive, but of course, at the end of the day, it does still use sound, so it really is a direct descendant. If you want to hear the whole unedited conversation with Adam, whose enthusiasm, I think, is evident even from these clips, it's available as a separate video exclusively over on Nebula with a few extra bits as well. This video is there with an entirely different ending, and all the videos on Nebula are ad-free. Nebula is a streaming platform that I co-founded, I'm really excited to be a part of, but before I get to the sponsor read, I wanted to take a minute to update you regarding the channel. I haven't uploaded much recently recently, and I often see YouTubers uh, apologize when that's the case, which I find kind of the wrong way of looking at it. I don't think creators should feel guilty about not posting, but I do wish that I could do it more often. Life has, has just been really busy recently. Yes, part of that is the ailing NHS and ongoing COVID chaos in hospitals, but it's been good busy too. I'm living my best dad life. I don't want any sympathy or anything like that. I've been working also single-handedly to convert this flimsy garage into a studio slash gym slash workshop slash place for all my bikes. So I haven't been able to film much, but time when I can't film is never wasted because I've now got... I think about eight videos simultaneously on the go in different stages. In addition to my editor, I've hired a research assistant. And so to make these videos reality, I'm always very grateful for your support. Watching this far is already amazing. Liking, subscribing, commenting, all that jazz is like auscultating a juicy murmur. But if you want to support the channel and get yourself the best deal in streaming, then please sign up right now for the Curiosity Stream and Nebula bundle for less than $15 for an entire year. Curiosity Stream have been my stalwart sponsors for a long while now, and I love recommending them because there you will find thousands of brilliant documentaries on science, medicine, history, culture, and loads more. You know me, I'm a natural skeptic and also quite allergic to the self-help productivity guru mumbo jumbo, so I was very surprised to find myself the other day engrossed by the science of success, which summarizes some research into what makes people successful. And there is loads more to discover. Nebula is a home to indie creators making equally thought-provoking videos. And what's really exciting is how much the exclusive content is growing. Videos you won't find anywhere else, like the insanely ambitious and hilarious jet lag, which is a sprawling, literal race around the world game show, to Tech Alter's phenomenal blend of history and media that takes a look at our relationship with tech. I really loved his latest about how Japan embraced technology. So help me keep making videos. Please sign up today at curiositystream.com slash medlife with the code medlife to get a year of both Curiosity Stream and Nebula for only $14.79, about £12.50. So all those thousands of videos, all ad-free for a year. Well, thanks for watching. Remember, if you want to practice any of the skills that we've talked about today, try going to your local pub and ask to tap the wine barrels. Place your ear against a stranger's chest, and most importantly, always perform autopsies to confirm your findings. Au revoir!